Okay, now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, just a second. So um, we come to you tonight from uh, Baba, or we come, come, I come to you tonight from Chimamak Duag uh, or Chimamak Hill, which is a Atom Four Horned Lizard on whose uh, homelands we uh, sit, as well as the Yaki and the Hopi peoples. Across the valley from Chimamak Duag is Baba Dak or Toad Mountain to the Atom. Um, we just released our first issue of Sonoran Herpetologist for 2021. Um, there's lots of great uh, material in there. Um, and uh, we thank Howard Clark, our wonderful editor for putting together a rich issue, as well as of course the contributors. Um, We uh, are about ready to approve $3,000 for another round of uh, research under the Charles H. Lowe Herpetology Research Fund for 2021. That'll be in October. Um, in 2019, we awarded um, almost $3,000. Um, and uh, in 2020, uh, the projects that you see here on the screen were approved, but uh, have been postponed because of COVID. Um, so if you're considering being a member, here's one of the things that your <coughs> membership will contribute to. Original research, a great uh, newsletter. Um, we have a, a Sonoran Desert Toad conservation team uh, that is being prepared in Sonora for, um, for toad monitoring in the future. These two books have just come out. They were written by fellow THS members, uh, Andrew Holy Cross, Joseph Mitchell, and Mark, Mike Cardwell. They're excellent books, and uh, I hope that you're able to uh, snag a copy. <coughs> We have almost reached $5,000 for the Philip C. Rosen Fund, um, which seeks to preserve his, his legacy in his field notes and data um, at, by archiving it online and, and publishing it uh, and getting his last projects uh, wrapped up and published. So um, if you are interested in donating, go to our website hit the donate button. And from there, you just follow the directions on how to donate and uh, choose the Philip C. Rosen Fund or any other uh, cause uh, in the THS. You can also print out a, a, a donation form and send it in manually. Well, um, it's uh, time to uh, present uh, Gary Nabhan, who will talk to us about the traditional knowledge and conservation of reptiles with the Konkak or the Seri. Um, he is a Kellogg Endowed Chair in Southwestern Borderlands Food and Water Security at the University of Arizona. And he's also the founder for the Center for Regional Food Studies, also at the University of Arizona. Um, but uh, apart from, from this, uh, he is an agricultural ecologist, ethnobotanist, ecumenical Franciscan brother, and author whose work has focused primarily on the plants and cultures of the desert Southwest. He is a pioneer in the local food movement and the heirloom seed saving movement. He has authored more than 30 books, including Singing the Turtle to Sea. Uh, which is the Konkak or Seri Art and Science of Reptiles. Uh, he's received many awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship, 
the John Burroughs Medal and the Lennon Literary Award for Nonfiction. Tonight, his talk will dis uh, he will discuss the efforts to build capacity among the Seri to manage their natural resources that began about two decades ago with Northern Arizona University facilitating training of more than two dozen para-ecologists who now work as wildlife technicians, ecotourist guides, sustainable harvesters of heritage foods and native, uh, excuse me, and habitat monitors. These efforts are documented in the film Seri Songs of Survival produced by Laura Monti and Flagstaff filmmaker, Peter Blystone. The project's results are also recorded in Gary's book, Singing the Turtles to Sea, as well as by the Seri in Southwestern Naturalist Journal and the Marine Turtle Conservation Newsletter. Gary says, the fate of the oceans affects us all so that it is not surprising that most that most lasting conservation solutions will have to be cross-cultural, building multi-ethnic constituencies. Uh, Dr. Monti, Ms. Molina, Ms. Estrella, and Mr. Morales deserve credit in forging and fine-tuning a model for conservation collaborations across cultural and national boundaries, one that has applicability in other marine and coastal ecosystems as well. Um, Gary is also uh, a dear friend who I've known for a couple of years now. He's a, a mentor and um, it's my, my pleasure and uh, an honor to, to welcome him. So one second, Gary, I'm going to stop my screen share and get some stuff out of the way here. And I'll let some more folks in. <laughs> People waiting. <laughs> yeah. All right. Welcome those of you who have just come in. Gary, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Let me see how I can. Uh, I'm good at this. Let's see. Now we have two here. I think it's. This one, let's see. Is that up yet? It sure is. And let me put it on the slideshow. Uh, there we go. Um, first, uh, uh, thank you all um, for being uh, with us tonight. And I'm going to be uh, short and just give you sort of a progress report and, a, and an invitation that I'll talk about in a second. But I want to say that uh, over the last uh, 22 years, um, my wife, uh, Laura Monti, and I have worked on various uh, training and capacity building uh, projects with the Concock or Sherry so that um, their knowledge of the desert and sea, which is, you know, goes back thousands of years, can be part of their livelihoods today. And, and um, I want to thank the dozens of uh, Siri individuals that have participated in not only um, being trained by Siri elders in Western academic scientists on some of the topics that I'll be talking about, but the, the, the elders themselves who were the, the trainers side by side on equal par in excellence in teaching uh, with the, uh, for the younger people. And that those events continue today and we're heading down uh, to the two um, Concock villages um, Thursday uh, to bring more medical and, and food supplies now. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the work of Kathy and Steve Marlad, I think, uh, very elders in Western. Oops, I'm having a little bit of echo. Did, uh, are we okay? Are you all getting an echo? No, that, that was my fault, Gary. I just uh, corrected it. Yeah. 
So anyway, I, I also want to acknowledge the long-term work of uh, Steve Marlett and Kathy Marlett, uh, uh, who've uh, got not out not only the the Concock Dictionary, but many other uh, publications and and uh, training materials of vital importance to the persistence of the traditional knowledge that the uh, uh, communities have about the desert and sea. And, and I want to say that I think there's a perception among uh, field scientists that uh, there, there may be um, interest in them hearing what indigenous people have to say about some of the animals that they care a lot about, but that um, indigenous people don't necessarily um, have a desire to hear about all the scientific studies that go on with the animals in their home place. And I would say, in my experience, that's not at all true. There's great respect for the herpetologists that we've um, invited down to do trainings for the, uh, in Punta Chueca and Desemboque and uh, a real interest. I mean, after a, a formal presentation by uh, Scott Eckert or someone like Wade Sherbrooke or, or Jeff Seminoff, people ask them questions for hours. <laughs> They're really welcome because uh, people are, um, make daily observations that they're trying to figure out patterns for just like we do. And so there's really a high respect for people who know the, the critters uh, of whether of the desert or the sea um, in detail. And uh, there's really a lot of enjoyment of those interactions. So I wanna welcome you if, if you have interest in, in um, doing any work in, in that area, I'd love to introduce you to people who may share those interests with you that are from those communities. There's two particular topics that I want to bring up, one that I'll focus on, and that's the sea turtle work that uh, uh, Kathy Martellette's father, Edward Moser, started recording about 50 years ago, uh, or 60 years ago, and um, that because of the endangered status of several of those sea turtles and the effects of global warming, we really need a lot of eyes and ears and, and uh, knowledgeable people on the ground to help figure out how climate change is affecting the distributions and abundance of uh, sea turtles in particular, but all the reptiles. The other thing that concerns me is that the old, uh, Reptiles and Amphibians book uh, uh, that many of us uh, uh, grew up on the field guides uh, up until Rohrbach's uh, wonderful book on uh, Reptiles of Sonora really um, stopped a lot of the distribution set at Rocky Point at Puerto Penasco. And there was a gap between there and the tropics on the coast where there were many observations. And now with this coastal highway that's been in for six or seven years that uh, you can get on at Cavorca, go out to the coast and then down the coast uh, past, past Puerto Lobos and, and um, Puerto Libertad down into the, the Siri reservation area, there's, there's an enormous amount of space that wasn't accessible to many people before then that really needs to be checked out for not just range extensions, but even micro endemics uh, between Rocky Point and Kino Bay that just weren't covered in many books. And there's very, very few um, distributional records from that area. So anyone that's interested in camping on that coastline uh, north of uh, Concock territory, happy to go camping with you out there. And, and uh, especially in the summer months, look for um, the night snakes that, that uh, were the toughest part of trying to get the, the uh, Concock names uh, 
to uh, have some uh, correlations with scientific names. There's, there's just a lot that needs to be done there. So with those introductory notes, let me just again, uh, thank my wife for helping me put together these, these um, eight slides and I'm gonna go fairly quickly through them. Um, most of you know where the uh, Concoc communities of Punta Chueca and Desemboque are north of Kino Bay, but remember that uh, the territory of these indigenous people went from in Palme or a little bit south of that all the way up towards um, uh, Libertad and Puerto Lobos. And there was knowledge all the way up to the Gulf, uh, uh, to the Colorado River Delta and over to Baja California. So the small reserve that the uh, is Seri homeland today is just a small part of their knowledge of a much larger range of uh, sea and land and there that's the spatial part of that but in addition to their own very detailed observations of the reptiles they see today there's an enormous amount of oral history about the former distributions of uh, animals like crocodiles and sea snakes so again um, think of uh, the knowledge about reptiles available in those two villages is not only pertaining to the uh, that landscape at this point in time, but to a much larger landscape and seascape with oral histories that are verifiable going back hundreds of years. And the, the map that you see on the, um, that's a drawing uh, next to the um, more, uh, topographic map locates all the Ime or sea turtle gatherings uh, uh, places and beaching areas uh, that the um, Concoc elders recall as being active during their lifetime. So there's a, a large number of place names both for gathering grounds of sea turtles and of, of land reptiles um, two that are significant place names. I'm going to focus on uh, the uh, sea turtles that are, um, are key to the trainings that we're continuing to do with the Seri uh, paraecologists who've gone on not only to publish scientific papers as co-authors about sea turtles tagged or radio collared in the Canal de Inferno in the Gulf that have showed up in Japan and showed up in Peru. <laughs> but they're also doing a lot of uh, nesting site protection at multiple places along the Canal de Inferno. And I want to tell you a little bit of the story about how that began. Um, we knew that the younger people that that are now young adults and have kids of their own, um, uh, didn't have the chance to roam widely as sea turtle hunters like their parents and grandparents, but knew all those stories. And um, my daughter lives in Hawaii. And one time when we were in Hawaii with her, we bought a, a video about native Hawaiian youth protecting sea turtle beaches and contributing to knowledge about the sea turtles um, off the shores of the Hawaiian Islands. And immediately, as soon as that 15 minute video was done, 12 of the uh, Seri youth jumped up and said, that's what we want to do. <laughs> and they started a, 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 their own sea turtle conservation group that I think about five years later, won a World Oceans Day Award from uh, National Geographic and the Jacques Cousteau Society. And five of the, the Sarah youth went back to Washington, DC to accept this honor in the National Press Club. All of us had to borrow sports jackets to get into the National uh, Press Club, but everyone was wowed by, by what these young people were doing. And that work continues 
to this day. And it's important for reasons that I'll that you'll see in the next slide because it's tracking these five species um, and many what we might call races or morphological varieties and developmental stages of uh, the five species. So think beyond the species level that there's 14 names associated with different kinds of green sea turtles alone, Chelonia Midas. Some of those are developmental uh, stages and some of them are geographic races. And so um, uh, keeping track of all of that and whether numbers are increasing or declining, whether uh, new uh, uh, beaches are once again being uh, used for egg laying is all this dynamic influx um, uh, situation down there because the impacts of um, two things um, that now we've had 30 years of a so-called ban on sea turtle hunting. There's always been clandestine hunting and, and capture of, of sea turtles on shrimp trawlers, but nevertheless, there is some rebound of some of these populations. And second of all, with global warming, they're moving around much more than um, they had in the past and we're all, all always been uh, surprised. So for most of the time that I've been working down there, there have been hawksbills in Kino Bay and during the summer and up towards Disemboke and occasional nesting uh, being seen. But more recently, um, uh, Olive Ridley and green sea turtles and even one or two um, uh, nesting attempts by leatherbacks are are uh, being reported. Uh, the uh, careta careta uh, loggerhead is one of the few that we don't see much of a rebound yet with, um, although there's plenty of known sites from historic periods, um, especially from Kino South that fishermen and sea turtle hunters knew. So in ways, the, the loggerhead is the one we have the fewest recent reports on. Uh, uh, the Olive Ridley uh, nesting is actually quite remarkable. And I wanna spend a moment on that because uh, Ridleys are one of the sea turtles most affected by uh, global warming, both the, the uh, Atlantic Ridleys and, and the Pacific Olive Ridley and, and the point I'm getting at is that we're seeing a tremendous change in the sex ratios uh, favoring uh, females um, at most nesting sites on both coasts of North America. And, um, and attempts to nest further and further uh, north again, uh, even north of Rocky Point now and then. And so this is something that because um, uh, laymen have such a hard time even uh, sexing the, the sea turtle hatchlings, we really need some scientific help in, in tracking those ratios from year to year and looking at the long-term effects of moving toward not an all female population, but a largely female population in the sea turtle uh, nesting sites that are being protected around Disemboke and to a lesser extent around Punta Chueca. We were down there in, in October last year when one morning alone in front of two Mexican TV station cameras and, and journalists from several countries, 740 Olive Ridley hatchlings were released by the children back into the ocean after being um, uh, protected um, uh, by fencing and netting and daily monitoring. And uh, 60 to 70 of the villagers came out before dawn uh, to count the hatchlings and, and release them. And it was a powerful, powerful experience that got picked up all over Mexico and even in US and Canadian media. So the hard work that the, 
that uh, young people in the Konka communities have done for over 22 years now to protect the sea turtles that their grandparents were, were formerly hunters of is, is really, really remarkable and is paying off dividends. But we have to think about some really interesting things now. Should we put um, more denser um, uh, shade cloth over the, the hatching zone and even on the sides to try to reduce the temperatures of the sand in the, the nesting area to see if we can rebalance the sex ratios. What else can we do uh, there? I don't know, pour cold water on the, on the nesting clusters or what? But some of those things really have to be looked at because by all indications, it's, it's uh, quickly moving percentage-wise towards more and more females every year. Real quickly, Gary, I have a question. The, uh, the name uh, seems to be toad sea turtle. The, uh, yes. Mosni Otak, Otak? Yeah, Otak is, is the name for, um, uh, maybe uh, uh, Steve or Kathy want to jump in, but I think it's a generic ter term for, for uh, toads and frogs. And so it's, uh, I assume it's the shape of the, uh, the head and some behavioral things. Uh, if you can un, uh, mute Steve and Kathy, <laughs> you may get a better answer. Okay. They do have a vocal, their throat does inflate a little bit too. Oh, that's, that's right. So could be that. Well, anyways, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I should also say that this area here, Desert Tortoise is making vocalizations mm -hmm. quite a bit too, something that Tom Van Devener and I'm sure some of the others of you had heard, have heard. Um, and then the, the situation with uh, Chelonia mitis is just so complex, I, I can't even uh, summarize that. Uh, Kathy's father, Ed, Ed Moser, had hundreds of pages of notes about uh, Surrey knowledge. Uh, 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 Ed and Richard Felger and um, Bill Regal and Kim Clifton had a cover uh, story of Science Magazine in the early 70s um, about the overwintering grounds uh, at these Mosni Yime uh, 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 places in the Gulf. And um, Guadalupe Lopez, who I worked with, uh, discovered one that was sort of a, um, a gathering grounds for males as opposed for females. So there's a tremendous amount of subspecific information on green sea turtles. And um, while some of the older men felt that all of those gathering grounds in the Canal de Infernio were abandoned at one point, some people say that they're being repopulated again. So again, there's really some great dynamics uh, that needs to be followed. And then the, the most touching relationship that the Konkak have with sea turtles is with leatherbacks. It again is a bottomless pit of spiritual and, and zoological dimensions. Uh, very, very hard to summarize, but, but um, they, they have this a uh, name of great esteem uh, when leatherbacks come on the shore, they, they, they go by this name of the Hiko Motomano, which is a name of reverence, uh, the uh, leatherbacks, because they weep and, and are clearly sentient beings, have this very high status in, um, in Konkak culture and we took, I think, 15 uh, Siri elders and youth down to Toto Santos about eight years ago uh, with Carl Safina to, to um, so that the elders could do their leatherback sea turtle ceremony that they hadn't been able to do in their own homelands. 
for some time because of the scarcity of leatherbacks. At that point, there were only 500 female leatherbacks between Mexico and Peru along the west coast of Mexico and dire population predictions. But um, the, the full ceremony was done at Todos Santos, so the knowledge of that ceremony has been passed on uh, to the next generation. And um, there's, there's these, these beautiful stories with spiritual dimensions. Um, one about a woman sea turtle hunter that whose husband died and his bones in the front of her balsa kayak like uh, craft guided her to where uh, sea turtles could be found to keep her and her children from starving. And um, there's a commentary that will just play a short bit of about that story uh, in Siri that you can just get a sense of the, that's, I, I can't translate it all, but uh, you'll get a sense of the detail. Yeah, there we go. And now, and then the next one is a, a remarkable drawing uh, by our friend Brenda in Desemboque of uh, a uh, leatherback ceremony. You can see the uh, women greeting the leatherback as it comes ashore. And those seven lines between where the, the crowd is standing on the beach um, are the siete filos, <laughs> metaphorically the seven uh, ridges of the of the uh, sea turtle itself embodied in the the uh, high wave lines of of the beach, and uh, the leatherback is painted with the same face paintings. No one should be present at the ceremony unless their face is painting, and then. Uh, in most cases, a sea turtle is released back into the, the waters. There's been a couple cases where they were already so weak that they died on shore. And then there's sort of sacramental uh, dimensions of what happens then. But here's a, a, a leatherback song from our friend Manuel Monroy. So all this is to say that there's incredibly detailed knowledge about the movements, the morphology, the, the correlations of the flavor, fragrance, and diet of sea turtles at different times of the year that feed at different depths um, in the water. And th this is just a, this is not all the terms associated with the anatomy, excuse me for misspelling anatomy and morphology of sea turtles. But there's, there's even more than this that we could go into. And this is just a, a partial uh, list of the vocabulary terms related to sea turtles, place names, um, morphological terms, a uh, whole bunch of other um, elements of people's interaction with uh, the sea turtles. Conservation issues, again, of most concern is how 
um, dynamic the situation is now where old beaches for nesting might have been abandoned at the lowest numbers of, of sea turtle populations. But now with global warming, it seems that they're moving northward again. And except at Disembocay and, and uh, Punta Chueca, most of those other recolonized or new nesting beaches are unprotected. And, and it's critical to get people do, doing the same thing that my Estrella and the dozen other uh, Asari people are doing to, to uh, protect those beaches from dogs and coyotes. With the warmer sands, as I said, the sex ratio is changing, but that needs track through time. There's still clandestine harvest for sea turtle soup in Sonora, even though the officials deny that that's still going on. We've, we've seen it listed as a daily special in restaurants in Hermosillo and Wymas. And um, there's continued reports that the sea turtle excluders that were mandatory are being detached once the boats get out of harbor after they're checked and that sea turtles are being boarded and uh, hidden away on, on um, shrimp trawlers. In a larger sense, most of the impacts may be beyond the Gulf of California with, with the bycatch and the Humboldt current as far south as Peru and as far um, west as Japan where the radio colored animals have gone. So, so we can't think of these populations as restricted to the uh, Sea of Cortez. So it's global impacts. And that's all I wanna say, but um, except to open questions and any of you that are interested in being involved either in the summer and early fall uh, nesting beach protection or any other um, ways that you might um, introduce the CONCAC to other uh, skills and issues with uh, any of the reptiles. Uh, we're happy to help you in making contact with the people who are most interested in the, the herpetofauna down there. So thank you. And let's open this to questions, uh, uh, Beto. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, that was really wonderful. Um, I have a question uh, to start off. Um, the uh, the folk uh, ecology, folk ecological knowledge of of sea turtles, that that vast uh, uh, amount of notes, uh, it, has that been thoroughly uh, compiled or synthesized or um, looked at? Uh, as a cultural document uh, available? Well, because of this uh, 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 Siri Alliance, I won't call it a nonprofit, but they've accepted grant money through a number of different means um, and captured that knowledge from older people. They have their own notes about what's happening. Mm -hmm. And as I said, uh, several of them are on published scientific papers. But um, uh, Becky and Ed Mosher's uh, notes just go well beyond anything that's in print in English. Um, uh, uh, Steve and Kathy are archiving some of that. Kim Clifton's notes and measurements from his five or six years of working with the uh, CONCAC on sea turtle conservation in the 70s. I, he was my roommate when we were in classes at U of A and at Prescott College. So I was very um, aware of what he was doing at the time. Those have never made it into any archives and yet they're vital to get that at some point because he has measurements and population sizes that we could use as a benchmark with the sizes of the same sea turtle species and races today. And then Jeff Seminoff and Richard Felger, after uh, my book came out, did a much more detailed take in an anthology on the Gulf uh, and or on sea turtles in the Gulf um, that's 
probably the best existing source in English right now. I think Jeff was a senior author and Richard the junior author. Yeah, cool. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, you can type them into the chat or uh, you can unmute yourself and, and uh, ask Gary yourself. I know uh, that um, that sea turtle was responsible for creating land. Is that correct, Gary? Yeah, I, and, and there's. Um, I'm afraid that my version of that story is telescoped and and doesn't do uh, full justice to it. And there's several other accounts in in Spanish that are sort of like. Uh, summaries of, of that, but there are one or two full um, transcriptions from Siri to Spanish that, that are excellent. So there, it's, it's really um, interesting. There's, there's mythological or, or, or um, origin narrative dimensions uh, to um, sea turtles for the, for the concoct just as there are turtles and tortoises all over North America, our turtle island uh, kind of thing. Um, and there's, I read into some of those, the special relationship that the Concoct have prehistorically with, with um, Baja California, that, that leatherbacks, giant stingrays, boojums and all of that are associated with their own ancestors who they, uh, or, or another group of people who they called the gigante. So there's a sort of high esteem and mythological dimensions of anything of that size. Uh, Saguaros and, and Cardones also have a special place. Well, um, Melissa from Advocates for Snake Preservation uh, in the chat, she gets, says, we thought you said it was possible to sex hatchlings. How do you do that? I, I don't think it is, is it? To do, I'm sorry, say that again, I didn't hear. To, to determine the sex of uh, hatchling sea turtles. I've been on beaches in the Carolinas where, where uh, the, the professionals there are getting sex ratios of the hatchlings. Interesting. Yeah, so I, and again, um, uh, it's been uh, several years now, so I forget the technique, but it's it's really, really important that we get some fix yeah. on that, either by uh, direct or means. Miles Pratt Hagen says that it requires endoscopy, and, and to my knowledge, I believe that is true. Um, this is uh, done by a, a, a doctor named Gerald Kukling, who, who sort of, I think, pioneered the endoscopy of that with endangered turtles. Um, so it will be good. I'd be happy to put him in touch with, with uh, uh, anybody wanting to know uh, how to do that in the, in the Sari community. Um, but it's a very, del it's, it's, you have to know, really know what you're doing. Um, Cause it is. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, it's not guesswork at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, if anyone has some ideas on how we can see what kind of buffering from, from hotter sands would, would help uh, just minimize the, the shifts, uh, you know, look me up and track me down. We're, we're, uh, I thought I had some 80% uh, shade, um, uh, shade cloth ordered from Jean Joseph, but it's been... Uh, he's lost his contact on shade cloth that company turned over and they're not making it with grommets anymore. So I have to order from another place now. Well, let me know. I, I, uh, I could probably help you with that myself. Um, yeah. uh, Matthew Mayer asks, uh, have you personally seen a, a change in the leatherback population that you know of? Well, change is hard to say because they, we just, the frequency of any observations is so um, infrequent. So Richard Felger and Kim Clifton and I saw a leatherback 
strangled by nets washed up uh, on the Colorado River Delta north of El Golfo in 1975. Mm. And I've since only seen them on the Baja side uh, personally, but I, but I know of people that have, you know, once every three or four years, we, we hear of a sighting on the Sonoran side. Mm. But um, and they're you know pretty unmistakable. But again, they're they're such a small size compared to some of the uh, accounts of leatherbacks, say around San Diego in the 1880s, 1890s, where they were as big as a pickup truck. So so there's there's not just a decline in total numbers, but in age structure. Uh, there's been severe changes and, and the population models just don't look good mm, mm. by anyone's um, uh, accounting. Yeah. And it's in part because they're, they're still out. They, they all go down off the coast of uh, Ecuador and Peru where the big mega uh, uh, fishing fleets are. And, and that's where the bycatch is the most uh, horrific. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I know that you uh, have to keep moving, Gary. You're a busy man. Um, is there any, I'm gonna do one last call for questions before we uh, wrap up this meeting. And uh, if, you, if uh, you do have questions after we're done, uh, oh, let's see, Melissa asks, what's the best way to get in touch if we're interested in volunteering? Should I just send them your email or? Yeah, yeah, send them the email and I'll give you uh, Lori, my wife's too. Uh, and we have a, uh, a place in Cots where we can put people up in Desemboque during during the period of the hatching. We were down there last summer and fall. And now that we've gotten vaccinated and most of the Uncaught communities are stabilized due to their remarkable uh, paramedics and, and promotores de salud working with my wife, there's not been any uh, deaths or hospitalizations from COVID for six months now. Oh, that's so they, they've really had that under control, but they sort of had a lockdown of their villages uh, to make sure that there was an outside input. And now we're, we're asking that if people go down, they make sure that they've had two vaccines. But, but yeah, anyone feel free to contact me. My, my emails, uh, I have a website that's just my name that has an email portal, or you can go through uh, the U of A one that Beto will give any of you. And thank you all for your good work. I, I learned so much from your publications and I'm eager to be in the field with any of you who wanna go down that way. So blessings to all of you for the wonderful work that's, that the society does and you do individually. And um, know that all of you that uh, contributed to the Phil Rosen Fund are in our heart too. I was just looking for Sonoran mud turtles down at Quito Bakito last Friday. So we're, we have, I can't go to Quito Bakito without <laughs> feeling Phil's presence among us. So thanks he, again. Yeah, it leaves us a big, big hole to, to fill and um, um, he lives on through us now. So, oh, oh yes, you that, to... your nickname in, in uh, Konkak is uh, which means horny toad, right? Horned lizard. Yeah, they simply had met Wade Sherbrooke when they gave out that name, or he would have gotten it. But um, <laughs> somehow, because I learned the sort of nursery rhyme about a, a saga in a horny toad's life, um, I got the name instead of Wade. But uh, <laughs> and uh, what you know, I see that Bob Beasy is here. Uh, we should call him what what uh, the name for night lizard is. Do you happen to? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't pull it up right now. I'd have to dive back into the book. But, okay. uh, I'll look it up for Bob and, and yeah. we'll, we'll christen him yeah. uh, Night Lizard Man. 
<laughs> it's sure fun looking for them, though. <laughs> anyway, uh, if if you uh, the, the joke in the villages down there is that I only eat ants, <laughs> <laughs> but I like my ants nicely grilled with a lot of hot sauce. So very good. Anyway, best wishes to y'all. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.